Today's class is Hasidic stories. And uh, we're going to go through a number of uh, uh, Hasidic stories from different books. There's numerous books out there uh, of Hasidic stories. And believe it or not, uh, Hasidic stories are quite popular, even among non-Hasidim. And, uh, you know, you'll find that some of them may talk to you more than others, but there's always something inspirational that we can take from these Hasidic stories, even though many of them talk about miracles, but even the miracles, there's, there's always some type of uh, inspiration that uh, awakens in us that joy of being Jewish or that joy of God having a special relationship with the righteous. And so Hasidic stories are definitely a uh, great enhancement to uh, anyone's day-to-day uh, -day life. Uh, I should mention also that the Lubavitcher Rebbe once had a meeting with a non-Hasidic uh, individual um, and uh, this individual was a teacher and uh, the Rebbe asked this teacher, do you tell stories to your students? And the teacher, uh, said, no, I, I don't feel it's right to tell, you know, to take away time from my uh, Torah learning and my obligation to teach Torah, to use, spend that time to uh, tell stories, you know, uh, to my students. I feel, you know, I don't feel it's really right. They hired me to teach. And um, the Rebbe told him that Absolutely, you have to tell stories, and that's part of the it's part of Torah, and part of it. Very, you know, this is really an integral part, a uh, crucial part of, of, of education is teaching the stories. In fact, even the Talmud, even the Mishnahs, even the Mishnah that we learn together in the morning, uh, we, we the first mission of the of the whole Talmud starts uh, says a story. Stories are uh, tr very very important. Uh, to give us the, the feeling, the life, the excitement for Yiddishkeit. And so it turned out that this uh, teacher uh, listened to the Lubavitcher Rebbe and he became the most popular storyteller in the whole city of Detroit. And uh, it turned out that um, uh, I read this, uh, he, this teacher passed away maybe like two years ago. And uh, in, their, in the eulogies that they wrote about him, they wrote how he was the most popular storyteller and it all started because the Lubavitcher Rebbe told him how that he should include stories in his teaching. So Hasidic stories and, uh, are definitely a uh, great enhancement to the life of a Yid. To, if we want to live like a Jew, we got to make sure to uh, at least have a few stories on our tongue or try to live by them, uh, think of them. And so um, I'm going to share with you some stories and you're welcome to ask questions and to also share if you know any stories as well. You can, you know, you're welcome to uh, share stories. I know we have uh, Rabbi Olenski here, who's uh, uh, quite a popular storyteller in the city of North Miami Beach. Uh, used to give the, uh, the kids program. So I, I definitely can't uh, compete with you, uh, Rabbi David, but uh, I'll do my best. And you're welcome to share any stories uh, uh, if anyone else has stories. You're welcome to, uh, to share them. So the first story is a story based on the, um, based on a saying of the Maggid of Kuznets. The Maggid of Kuznets uh, once said that the reason why Hashem gives us, created us with two eyes is because one eye is meant to see the greatness of Hashem and the other eye is to see the lowliness of man. And Rabbi so, Smith, yes. Rabbi Smith, I was just going to ask you if you can mute everybody until they speak, because I okay. keep on having this giant green telephone that's flashing on and off instead okay. of your face. Okay. Yes. Mm. Yeah, thanks for reminding me. So um, uh, as I was mentioning that the Maggot of Kuznet said a... Uh, 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 he said a vart, like a word of Torah. He said the reason why Hashem created uh, uh, every person with two eyes 
is because one eye we're supposed to see the greatness of Hashem and the other eye we're supposed to acknowledge the lowliness of man. And uh, the, the, um, the story goes like this. There was two brothers, two famous brothers, Rabbi Eli Melech of Lezhensk and Rabbi Zusha of Anipoli. And uh, they uh, had this debate. Uh, one of them claimed that first you should think about, meditate on the greatness of Hashem. And afterwards, uh, one should contemplate on the worthlessness of humans, of themselves, of, you know, feeling humble. And uh, the other one said, no, first you should feel humble, and then you should contemplate on the greatness of Hashem. So uh, we have this, you know, these two important elements of Yiddishkeit, which is to realize the greatness of Hashem and to feel humble before Hashem. And the question is, which one to do first? And uh, these two brothers, these two uh, very famous and chas very holy uh, Hasidic leaders, Rabbi Zusha of Anipoli, Rabbi Eli Melech of Lezhens, two brothers, and they debated which one to, what comes first. Where do you start? And, um, you know, obviously uh, we can debate it ourselves. You know, is it more important to refine ourselves, feel humble before we, are, we contemplate on Hashem? Or is it more contemplate on the greatness of Hashem will make it easier for us to feel humble afterwards? Because once we understand the greatness of Hashem, uh, we can, it, it'll be easier maybe to, to, to feel humble. And so they brought this question to their teacher, the, the Magid of Mezrich. And um, the Magid of Mezrich said, listen, both are correct. But the idea that one should first consider one's lowliness really comes first before considering the greatness, before meditating on the greatness of Hashem. And um, the, uh, the Hasidim, or at least one of the Hasidim, felt this is very fitting to the uh, famous debate in the Talmud. Uh, the Talmud has a question, uh, it's a Mishnah uh, between Beis Shammai and Beis Hillel, uh, that some places it says God created the heavens and the earth, and other places it says the earth and the heavens. There's different verses. So... And, uh, you know, like we know, that in the beginning Hashem created the heavens and the earth. But there's another word, verse that it says, uh, uh, So there are other verses that sp speak about earth and then heaven. And so uh, there's an argument between the house of Shammai and the house of Hillel, um, which one was created first, the heavens or the earth? So uh, the, uh, the, 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 this uh, Hasid or this uh, Hasidic group felt that this was uh, apropos for the, this debate because this is, it's sort of like a uh, uh, symbolic of this, of, of this question. Should we concentrate on the heavens first? Should we concentrate on the earth first? So this is, that's the story. And, um, uh, you know, and the house of Hillel holds that the earth was created before the heavens. And that would be fitting with the statement of the Magad of Mezrich that, you know, we follow Hillel and the Magad of Mezrich said that we first should contemplate uh, and uh, think about, consider our low, the lowliness of man. And only afterwards uh, can we really um, um, meditate on the greatness of Hashem. So that's the, that's the story. And... Um, what comes to mind uh, is that, you know, if we, if we think about the lowliness of man first, I guess it allows us to, um, to not be limited in our meditation of God. In other words, when we think about ourselves too much, when we have a, uh, uh, you know, a element of arrogance or feeling of, uh, uh, pompousness uh, uh, regarding ourselves. 
So we can't really uh, absorb, um, understand the greatness of Hashem. And uh, by feeling humble first, maybe, maybe, it's just a thought, maybe this allows us to, um, you know, to, to be able to meditate uh, greater on Hashem. Obviously, uh, the other option is correct as well. The, the, the Mizritcha Magad said they're both correct. Elu ve'elu divrei alikim chayim. These and these both are words of Hashem. So meaning that the Magad acknowledged that they're both correct. And maybe that's, that's why, uh, maybe that's why the Hasidim found the source for both sides, Hillel and Shammai, Beis Hillel and Beis Shammai. But uh, the, the Magad concluded that this is the, the better way. So it seems that uh, there is some benefit of contemplating on the, you know, the humility before contemplating on the greatness, on the greatness of Hashem. Um, does anyone want to want to have any thoughts on this uh, story? Well, um, you get pretty humble when you see a picture of the galaxies in the universe. Somebody uh -huh. once made, took a, uh, had a picture of another galaxy because you can't take a picture of our own galaxy We're in the middle. But it was similar, they felt, with the spiral arms going out and lots of stars in the middle. But we aren't in the middle. It was like two thirds out of one of the, <laughs> one of the spiral arms. And he put uh -huh. up that little sign that you see in malls, you are here. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Well, that makes so, you humble when you realize you're not even an important part of your galaxy. <laughs> right, right. Well, I guess it tells you both how great God is to create. Oh, the, yes. The, the vastness of, of creation. Uh, so yes. I guess it, it's sort of like hand in hand. Uh, you get the whole thing at of, once. <laughs> yeah, you sort of get both at the same time. That's like a third option. We were talking about which one comes first. And uh, Will has the idea that maybe they both come at the same time. Um, all right. Um. Uh, um, when I was in yeshiva, so some friends of mine said, I, I don't understand how Hashem is concerned about how you wash your hands and how you tie your shoelaces. And they thought that was like, you know, not like almost ridiculous. And I said just the opposite. The fact that Hashem is concerned about how you tie your shoelaces and how you wash your hands, even though we're like, quote unquote, insignificant. But obviously, this is a very significant thing to Hashem. So even though he's busy, so to speak, the entire universe, he's still worried about that I should tie my shoelaces or I should wash my hands in a certain way. That shows the, the, the importance and significance of man, even though he's insignificant, so to speak. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Well, that's uh, that's uh, quite quite deep because we're talking about the lowliness of man, and yet, uh, but I, I guess that goes that that fits. In other words, the only thing that gives us significance is the fact that God wants a relationship with us, meaning that um, the, the, the initially we are insignificant, but. Because Hashem specifically uh, wants our actions, He wants our work. Because Hashem wants our work, uh, therefore, uh, it almost like that's that's what gives significance to everything we do. It's it's there is a there is an example that. When a person walks and they see ants crawling on the ground, uh, you know what the ants mean nothing to us. We're we're totally you know they're insignificant in our eyes because you know we have nothing to do with them. Whether they're, they're in a totally different league than a human, you know, so we just walk on them, so to speak. And um, uh, you know, a human to Hashem is much less than an ant to a human. So if you compare, and so the fact that Hashem says, I want you, I need you, I'm, you're important in my eyes. Could you do that in another way? Yeah. 
So the fact that Hashem says you're important in my eyes, that's actually what gives our entire uh, uh, entity significance. The, en- the existence of humans is, is significant because Hashem specifically says, you know, I want you, you're important to me. And so, 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 so that's the, uh, maybe that, you know, that sort of like ties your, uh, your uh, explanation, David, um, of how Hashem wants our actions. And that's, that, you know, that's really what gives it significance, even though initially, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're really insignificant. Yes, Tom. This is, I was going to say, this is connected to uh, the fact that the, oh, the Torah mean. was given on Mount Sinai. Which, even though it's a it's a mountain, it's a, it's a slow, the lowest of the mountains, but it's still a mountain. It's not a flat field, so there right. has to be some kind of pride in uh, an acknowledgement right. of that. Right, right, right. Okay, good point. Good point. Yes, Tom, you have a you had a, a uh, yes. Um, the Torah also says that Hashem created man in His image, so I don't think Hashem thinks we're entirely insignificant. Granted, we're not as significant as Hashem. But I think it's reasonable for us to assume some significance in ourselves and still be subservient to Hashem. Right. Well, that, that's that's a that's a good point. Uh, very, you know, very well 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 said and, and good source. Uh, um, uh, the 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 fact that Hashem created us in His image, uh, you know, obviously it shows that Hashem really wants us and he made us in a certain you know in a certain sense uh important but the humility that we're talking about is the fact that god gave us that free choice that we as humans often think everything comes from our abilities and really the fact that god made us in his image that is the answer to all arrogance is that you're great it's the fact that God made you in his image. It's, it's all Hashem. It all boils down, goes back to Hashem because he's the one who made us in, you know, in, in, you know, in his image. So in a, in a certain sense, it, it, it really uh, connects the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the idea that we're important with, with the, with the source of it being, ultimately boil boils down to Hashem, you know. Uh, Miranda, yeah. Yeah, there's another thing that also is connected to humility is gratitude. You know, I can't hear you uh, so clearly. It's very, yeah. very low. Can anyone have, can anyone else have this problem? I couldn't understand you. I have this problem also. I could not understand her. Okay, so maybe, maybe just speak a little louder. Maybe you're not near the mic, so maybe try to speak a little louder. The mic is right here. Can you? Oh, hear me now on? it's good. Now it's actually much better. Okay, great. So the only thing I was thinking of to add to this has to do with gratitude. Uh-huh. It has to be uh, thankfulness. If we start with the earth and start with humility, then we recognize um, not only how small and all of those, but how grateful we are to be created and to have a part in this whole um, play, uh, you know, situation. Uh huh. So, so having gratitude, um, it, it, what, what will that do? One second. Gratitude comes from humility. When uh-huh. you're humble, you can then be grateful for whatever you have or whatever um, obstacles come in your way. You can be grateful for them to learn how to overcome them. Or, right. you know, just a whole, a whole bag of um, things that occur. And so, 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 so that's, so it allows you to have more gratitude if you have humility. So maybe that would be why we should be humble before acknowledging the greatness of Hashem, because it'll allow you to have, when you're acknowledging the greatness of Hashem, you'll actually relate to it better because you'll be able to feel gratitude. I guess that's a, that's a very good point. Miranda, very good point. Uh, in other words, it's really talking straight to this uh, topic. Really, your really, uh, point is right on with, uh, with the final conclusion, how we should, we should really think about the meditate on the, the lowliness of man, because that will allow you to un- really understand better because of the gratitude part. You'll understand better the greatness of Hashem. Okay, good. Very good point. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, let's, let's continue with the next story.
Uh, this story is about a person, a family who could not have children. And um, they journeyed to the Magad of Kozhnitz um, to ask him to pray for them. And uh, of course, he gave them his blessing. And uh, sure enough, they had a child. Um, but the story doesn't end there. Uh, the child became very sick and they came to the Magad of Kozhnitz and uh, asked him, you know, again, to pray for the child. And um, the Magad of Kozhnitz, you know, told them, don't worry, uh, he's going to have a recovery. And uh, however, he didn't have a recovery and he was getting even more sick. And um, so sure enough, uh, the parents were staying by the side of, the, uh, uh, of this child, uh, you know, spending so much time with the child that uh, the mother ended up, um, the mother ended up um, uh, falling asleep uh, uh, and all of a sudden she awoke to see that there was someone standing there, like a, a soldier uh, leaning over the cradle and spoon feeding the child. And, uh, and, and it turned out that um, the child's condition started to improve. In the meantime, she was shocked. She, she screamed out of uh, uh, fear. She didn't know what was going on. She had just woken and uh, the, the soldier fled. But the baby started uh, regaining his strength and uh, sure enough, the uh, parents were so happy that they uh, traveled to uh, tell the Magad of Kozhnitz, you know, that Baruch Hashem, their child is uh, better. And, um, uh, and uh, um, you know, they wanted to give him the good news. So the, the but they told the Magad this weird story of how there was this soldier that was there when the mother woke up and the soldier fled. So the Magid uh, told them, don't worry, uh, everything is great, don't worry about the story. You know, they were nervous that maybe there's some evil spirit or some sorcerer that was causing problems. And so um, uh, what happened was, uh, uh, the Magid told, told them, don't worry. But after they left, the Magid uh, sent his shamash, which is his gabai, his helper. Uh, the Magid sent the, 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 the helper uh, to the cemetery. And this is a weird story, that he should strike the, uh, the grave of a certain soldier that's buried in this cemetery. So, uh, you know, with his, with his cane. So the um, the, sir, the 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 helper of the the shamash of the of the Magad of Kozhnitz went to the cemetery and and uh, a, gave a strike to the uh, to the uh, um, you know to the grave and said that um, uh, the Magad wants to see you. So sure enough, a person appeared uh, 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 at the Magad's uh, door. And the Magad asked him, um, you know, what do you have to being a doctor to heal children? Where, where do you come to be a doctor? What made you a children's uh, doctor? And the soldier told his story. And uh, the story goes like this. Um, he was, this person, this individual was taken away to be to, to, to be part of the to be to go to the army and uh, for military service and um, uh, he ended up uh, you know acting like the all the all the the non Jews there he dropped all putting tefillin on he dropped keeping Shabbos he dropped all the uh, mitzvahs and um, uh, became basically acted like a, like 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 a non Jew. And, um, and what, um, uh, what happened once 
was that the soldiers were uh, uh, traveling and uh, they found a, uh, um, a poor Jew on his way home from a village. They were uh, somewhere in the fields in the, in the forest. And um, the soldiers said, you know what? Here's a good opportunity. Let's, let's take advantage. So they uh, searched the guy's pockets. They took out his uh, whatever money he had. And uh, they figured, uh-oh, what's, what's going to happen if he tells anyone? So we're going to have to kill him. So they, they took him and they hung him on a tree. In the meantime, this Jewish soldier who was uh, not, didn't act like a Jew, he felt bad. So he waited around. They all left. And he went and he untied the Jew. And miraculously, he was still breathing. And... Uh, uh, he untied him f from being hanged and he, and he told him, so, you know, that uh, it feels bad. How much money did he have in his pocket? And he gave him whatever, how many rubles, uh, you know, a hundred rubles. And he gave him the rubles and he said, uh, you know, you can go on your way. Uh, and and that, was, that was it. The only thing is that it took him a little while till he untied this guy. And um, in the meantime, the soldiers had gone back to their commander and uh, the commander said, where, where is uh, that other soldier? And uh, they got all nervous. They, they came running and they found the soldier, the Jewish soldier. Uh, they found him, uh, you know, in that area where the, the other, where the person that they killed, where they had hanged that person that they killed. And so they looked and they saw that the person they killed wasn't there. So they decided they better kill this Jew because he's probably going to snitch on, uh, on them for what they did earlier. So, they, you know, they realized that he must have let the, the, other, the other guy go free. So they figured he's probably going to go tell the, uh, the, the commander. So they immediately killed him. They hung him and he died. So the soldier died. And... Um, and, um, and afterwards, they, they buried him. And the thing is, the thing is that uh, uh, after he died, he faced the heavenly court. And they said that they can't really let him into the Garden of Eden because he sinned so many sins. Um, and he lived a very, you know, a life of sin. But uh, they can't send him to hell because uh, not only did he save someone's life, but he actually gave his life up to save someone else's life. And so uh, if you save someone's life, it's as if you save a whole world. And so they said, we can't let you go to hell, but we also can't let you go to the Garden of Eden. And... Um, so uh, what they ended up, they decided that they'll let him uh, come down to earth and be a children's doctor, so to speak, that they has permission to save lives of children whenever the situation is desperate. So that is the story of this, uh, of this soldier, how he ended up um, saving the life of this little baby because he was given that ability to save lives. So that's the story. Now, the few things that uh, I'm not really sure. I mean, did he, was he physically alive? Is he more like an angel type of a person? Uh, not really sure how to understand it. Did he physically, I mean, he, you know, the shamash hit the grave, uh, hit the, hit the, hit the uh, you know, hit the monument, I guess, on the grave. Uh, and then he came, did he come in person to the, to the, to the maggot? Or was it more of a uh, voice? Like the soul came, maybe. So it, it seems to me like it must be more spiritual than a, a physical. I mean, you know, he went and hit the uh, hit the grave. Uh, it must be a spiritual uh, type of a uh, you know uh, ability of this uh, soldier that he's sort of like he's in heaven, but he has the ability to come and save people's lives. So in any event, I don't know. You can maybe you understand it differently, but that's uh, that was the uh, the way I understood it. And um, what we see from this story is very interesting how this person obviously knew that he's risking his life, and yet, and he wasn't following Judaism. 
at all. And yet he felt uh, such an obligation to save uh, and risk his life and give up his life, um, you know, uh, in order to save another person's life. Uh, it's quite a, quite a, quite a, uh, it really shows the, the, the power that, that, you know, that, that every uh, Yid has and, um, and how the, the mitzvahs, that even a person who, you know, never really doesn't uh, do mitzvahs, one, you know, they, there, there are definitely some serious mitzvahs that people have that are tucked away in their, uh, you know, we don't really uh, always realize them, but they're, they're there. Even, even people who are sinners, uh, they've got some very big mitzvahs. And those mitzvahs really save a person from going to hell. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm sure this uh, individual, after saving so many people's lives, um, my understanding is they, they, they must have let him into heaven after he uh, uh, saved, uh, you know, after he kept on saving the kids' lives. Uh, I'm sure they uh, ultimately he was forgiven from his, from his, um, he must have been forgiven from, from his sins. Any, any other uh, thoughts on this, uh, on this story? Anyone want to? Yeah, Rabbi. Now I can't hear you. Who, who is that? Yehuda? Yeah. Yes. Very low. I don't know why it's very low, at least on my computer. I'm going to hire my, my sound. Yes. Yehuda? Yeah. Okay. Well, you, you're welcome to, to speak. It's just, uh, it's a little low. Does everyone else also hear it? It sounds low? Yeah. Maybe it maybe we, low. Yes, it's low. Okay. To me too. okay, I'm going to mute everyone now. And uh, Yehuda, if you get muted, just unmute yourself. Okay. Okay. Okay, Yehuda, you unmute yourself, and then we'll we'll listen to you. If, if he did shuva, then he would go to heaven. You know, to Gan Eden. Right. Well, he he died before he did shuva. Ah. Okay. So. Yeah, so that's that's the story, you know. Well, if, but but if, if, he's saving, if he's saving all these children's lives, well, it, it seems like you know it's sort of like a. Uh, I, I'm not really sure how to understand it. I, I'm guessing that it's sort of like a a opportunity for him that God gave him to be able to uh, to get to the Garden of Eden by saving people's lives as a like an atonement, maybe. For his for the sins that he did, uh, either that or you could look at it as a reward. That you know, it's a very as a what as a reward for being for for oh. for the good deed that he did. That he gets the enjoyment of saving kids' lives. Uh, you know, maybe there's mm. there's that element to it. Um, oh yeah. You know, so maybe there's something something there. Again, it's a little vague the the, the story, uh, uh, and I'm not uh, you know I'm not the pro at. at uh, explaining it, interpreting stories. Um, okay, Ben. Ben, you want to say something? I have, a, I have a question. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't get why the soldier was uh, hung and who was the one that saved him. So, so the, 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 the story was that the, the initially this poor person, this simple person was traveling and he got hung. And the soldier saved him. Oh. And then, but they, they didn't want the soldier oh, to tell on them. So they had to, you know, so the, 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 they had to kill the soldier. Otherwise, the soldier would have snitched on, on, the, on the, all the other soldiers who, uh, who almost killed this person and stole from him. I see. Okay. Thank you. Okay, sure. You have to ask where the story comes from. Is, is it fair to give it the kind of credibility that makes us think so hard about interpreting it? Well, this is the thing. You know, Hasidic stories, we believe that, you know, even if they didn't exactly happen, there's some truth to them. So many of the stories happened, obviously. Uh, if you don't believe that any of them happened, then, you know, it's, uh, you know, then you're really a, a, a real skeptic, a real, uh, you know, then you're really... Uh, Is there a book, uh, Rabbi, with all these little stories? There's numerous books of Hasidic stories. In fact, there's oh. volumes and volumes 
uh, even oh, yeah. just the Baal Shem Tov himself, there's five, there's a, uh, five volumes and then there's another few volumes that have been written. So the, each, each Hasidic, and there are numerous Hasidic Rebbe's, and uh, the great Rebbe's had great powers and they could do great things that we uh, can't really relate to. With, it's, it's beyond our understanding. So I'm going to share with you. Yes, I'm sorry, Naomi. Yeah, we can't hear you. You got to press mute, unmute. Maybe that was one of those spurious green things that uh, we've seen. Um, no, I was focusing just on this story. Is it possible that this isn't one of the stories you're supposed to put your mind into so much because it didn't come officially? It didn't come officially. What does um, that mean? It didn't mean? come from, you know, somebody may have made it up and put it into the mix and we're having trouble interpreting it. No, we're not, we're not having that much trouble, but um, um, every story you could say that about, again, and, and that's, uh, uh, you know, th that's not the path that, um, that we want to take. We, we do, you know, we do acknowledge that, you know, we're not going to make a vow that this is every detail of this story is, is, is correct, but we, we, we trust that if it's not correct, the great Sadik, the Magad of Kozhnitz could have brought about a soul uh, and, you know, and, uh, and somehow, uh, uh, you know, spoken to the soul of someone who wasn't able to get into the Garden of Eden and, uh, you know, possibly, uh, uh, you know, uh, helped him either atone for his sin or, you know, the, the great Sadikim have uh, definitely have great powers. I mean, uh, you don't need me to, to reveal that, uh, Will. Um, there are new, you know, there are, there are stories that we have, you know, um, direct, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, pe people who directly were impacted by these stories who have told us stories about Sadiqim. So, we definitely know that the tzaddikim have great powers, but if you want to say that, you know, there might be some mistakes that have crept into some of the stories, yeah, you're right, it could be, but we still can learn them and we still can, can discuss them and, 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 and try to understand them and see if there's a message that we can take from the story. So I was just raising a uh, question. Are there possibly some unofficial stories going around that people who weren't as wise threw in for fun? Well, like, like Zoom bombing is done nowadays. I'm sure there, you know, there, 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 there are always uh, people who, uh, who make up things. But, you know, the, the thing is that it's interesting. It says, Sheker ain loy raglayim. Falsehood doesn't have any feet, doesn't have legs to stand on. So ultimately, <laughs> you know, like laugh, yes. <laughs> ultimately, false things will, will, will fail. So, you know, it works for a little while, but it, it, it doesn't last, you know. Okay, Naomi, you have a question. Yeah, my, I just wanted to make a comment. Sorry that I got messed up. Um, maybe that's like the ancestral spin on uh, it takes a village to raise a child. <laughs> what, what, what do you mean? Explain. Like the people come together the village people uh -huh. to to assist, and maybe that's a miracle through through God to bring a person to help and to assist, and maybe that's where the soldier came came to be through the village people. Right, right, right. So, um, very good, good point. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, any any can other I, can, thoughts? Yeah, can I just Rabbi, weigh in here? a question, oh. please. Is there any library when you can get uh, about uh, Judaism and stories? Or could we could go to your house or any place and meet together and uh, read stories. Definitely, you can uh, borrow books that I have if you'd like. Uh, there's also uh, probably, and I wonder if the... Uh, public libraries might have Hasidic stories. Uh, possible, very possible. Definitely, the Judaica stores have, if you, you know, and uh, definitely Jewish libraries. Um, yeah, but this is to read one time the stories, and that's all why I should buy every book. 
So, so my son yeah, may yeah, no, the library with this. Yeah, library would be would be a good idea. Yeah, definitely libraries. There's a library here in North Miami Beach that actually has a lot of Hasidic stories. Um, I'm guessing that Aventura might have a Jewish library. In other words, someone in their house. They oh, open I will library. go when I go to vote. I will ask them. Sure. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. okay. I'm sorry, David. You wanted to say something, right? Is that you? Yeah, no? yeah. Can, I don't know if it's possible to mute the, the folks because I keep on seeing the green thing and I hear background noise. Mute all. <clears throat> okay. All right now. So yeah. yeah. So what I was going to say was that um, just as, this is an example. Uh, the person who compiled a lot of these stories. Uh -huh. uh, there's there's the Rabbi Shlomo, Shlomo Yosef Zevin who passed away in 1978. And he has the treasury of Hasidic tales. And this and this story and literally probably, I don't know, thousands of stories are in these uh, books that he wrote. He was acknowledged as one of the greatest Talmudic and Halachic uh, prodigies of this century. And he was the founding editor of the monumental Talmudic Encyclopedia. He was a major author of scholarly and popular Torah literature. He was one of Israel's leading uh, authorities in Talmud and Halacha for nearly half a century. So it wasn't just some guy on the street that decided, oh, I heard this interesting story. I think I'll stick them together in some book. This, the person that wrote this was a, was a Torah giant. And he was, he, he was very, very much admired uh, by the Rebbe. And uh, I think that the Rebbe is validating to us that this is a source of true Hasidic stories. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, good point. So I heard, um, I heard a quick story once that uh, that Rabbi Zevin, after he had passed away, his wife at a certain point in time had come for a private audience for Yechidus with the Rebbe, and she was crying, and the Rebbe said to her, "Why are you crying?" And she said, "My, my man, my husband, Rabbi Zevin, never had an opportunity to see the Rebbe face to face." And uh -huh. the Rebbe said to her, don't, don't cry. He's in the room with us now. So the Rebbe sort of uh, validated his, his, his level to a certain extent, if you want to say it like that. Right, right. Uh, wow. so, it's, so, so it's a reliable source of stories. Very yeah, there's reliable. no question that the, 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 the um, you know, the stories have been passed on and they've been repeated by great, great, you know, by great people. Um, uh, you know, but, um, you know, the, the, obviously there's, a, there's room to question a little detail here or there, you know, uh, and uh, um, at the same time, you know, we know that the stories definitely have, you know, have truth to them and, and they, the great Sadiqim had the ability to do whatever it says in any of the stories, they definitely had the potential to do. Miranda, yes. Yeah, so maybe sometimes we look very deep for a meaning in a story, but maybe this story is just the value of one human life, that it's very important, each human life. And so the fact that this man or ghost saved somebody's life and then was offered to save more lives is the emphasis that uh, human life um, is worthy of saving. Um, and it's a great mitzvah to do that. It just may be that, uh, you know, maybe that simple. I don't know. Right, right, right. Well, yeah, there's definitely, uh, I mean, I, I, you know, the story definitely shows us how uh, amazing it was that one great mitzvah that he did and he gave up his life for it. And he wasn't a Orthodox Jew in any say, you know, say he wasn't a religious Jew in any uh, shape or form. And yet he, uh, he did that when all of his friends and, you know, it was totally, uh, um, you know, he was, it wasn't, uh, at all, um, had no connection with the, you know, with these type of, uh, with this, you know, with his whole, all of his friends were all these, uh, Goyim that he was used to hanging out with for years. And yet he, uh, broke away from them just to, you know, just to save, uh, you know, uh, this person. And, uh, he probably saw life and, you know, he probably saw, murder day and night you know being part of the uh, army um fighting wars and yet uh but when it came to you know help it you know when it came to 
st- stick, standing up for, 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 for truth, for, you know, for, to, to save a life. He, he did that. Um, and, uh, even though, even though he put his life, even though he, he, he caused himself to die, he put his, his put his life on the line and, and died. Uh, here's another story. Um, and, and, and this story is, it's a cute story. Uh, the days of the Baal Shem Tov, there was a person who uh, read some some Hasidic or uh, Kabbalistic, maybe Kabbalistic book, and uh, the Kabbalistic book said that if you if you don't uh, um, if you uh, don't speak idle talk for uh, forty consecutive days, uh, then you will be granted divine inspiration. And um, this person said, you know what? I've always wanted divine inspiration. And uh, he decided that for 40 days, he's not going to talk any idle talk. And uh, he was convinced that it's going to work because he read it in in one of these Kabbalistic books. And so uh, 40 days passed and uh, he didn't feel like he, you know, he became divinely inspired. So he traveled to the Baal Shem Tov and uh, he was very sad and he, he told the Baal Shem Tov that, you know, he can't understand um, uh, how, you know, it didn't work. He, 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 he did this, uh, uh, you know, th- this method of, of fast, of, of idle talk for 40 days, consecutive days. And, um, and so the Baal Shem Tov asked him, he says, did you pray during these, uh, during these uh, 40 days? He says, of course, three times a day. He said, did you recite the, uh, anything from the book of Psalms? He said, of course, I recited you know, the prayers. He says, in that case, the Baal Shem Tov said, well, you know, you babbled these words of the prayers uh, that is considered your idol talk. So that is the answer the Baal Shem Tov gave him. And what that means is that, you know, what we think, uh, you know, as is, is uh, our prayers and our mitzvahs, sometimes, you know, it really is, 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 is uh, it's not really where it should be. And you know, we think our prayers are, you know, we're, we're speaking to Hashem, but, you know, we, we, we sort of, uh, fall asleep during our prayers. We start drifting off and thinking about business or thinking about family, thinking about uh, an argument we just had. Uh, and uh, it turns out that our prayers could be considered like idle talk. Now, the question really is, if you think this person went back and tried it again, the 40 days and concentrated better on his prayers, and do you think he actually reached divine inspiration? And uh, and what does it mean that there's a promise, a commitment, you know, uh, that it says in the books that if you really don't talk for 40 days, consecutive days, you will get divine inspiration. And uh, obviously, if it says it somewhere, it's obviously true. But it seems to me that that's not, you know, that's not what's expected of us to have to, to not speak any idle talk for 40 days to get divine inspiration, meaning that's not really the job of Judaism to, for everyone to reach the level of divine inspiration or to, uh, you know, to, it, it just seems that, and especially using this, this trick of reaching divine inspiration, when divine inspiration should come maybe from direct holiness, not from some avenue that you found that it actually works if you don't do idle talk. But what about the whole, what about your whole person, your whole, uh, all of your traits, all of your character, and to, you know, to really reach a, 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 such a level uh, that you deserve divine inspiration. Um, uh, it would seem to me that, that, you know, that the Baal Shem Tov was, in addition to telling him that, you know, you're, you know, your prayers maybe aren't where they should be, but he's also, te- it was also telling him like, maybe, you know, you're really not in the level to go about 
the 40 day trick or, or maybe deeper than that is that this 40 day trick is for very righteous people when they reach a certain level of righteousness and they also do 40 days of consecutive days, then they're, you know, that's really the final step of them to, 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 to reach divine inspiration. But it's not for every Joe Schmo to try this, uh, to try this trick. It really is, a, it's, it's really effective. Uh, and maybe that is the avenue that, 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 that's supposed to be taken once a person reaches, you know, a, a very high level of, uh, you know, of tzaddik or a very, very high level. Uh, maybe then they, they are meant to, 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 to not speak for 40 days. But anyway, this is, this is the, uh, this is a story of the, of the Baal Shem Tov. And um, I think it has, I think it really does have a number of, uh, uh, teachings, uh, you know, that, that we've seen. Anyone, anyone have any thoughts on this or want to share? Want to share another story or a uh, question? I think one of the messages is the Baal Shem Tov was telling him that his self-worth was overblown in his own eyes. Right. Okay. Good. Well, well stated. Yes, uh, I agree. Good point gets back to the issue of whether he's humble or not. Right, right, right. It goes, it fits the, uh, it, it, it definitely fits. It looks like he wanted to know the greatness of God without doing the humble part. You know, he was, uh, wanted to enjoy the, uh, the, the divine inspiration, but uh, definitely wasn't ready for it. Yes, start- Ben. Sorry, you, you, it, show, it shows the, the greatness of spirituality. You what know, do you mean? How important spirituality is, you know. Uh-huh. That by, by praying with Kavana and by, by not talking foolish talk, it's, it's spiritual. It's, it's, uh-huh. You know, so it's as compared to physical, it's not a physical thing. Spiritual is more important. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Doing the mitzvot is one thing, but your spirituality, your thinking, and, and your spirituality is, is important. Okay. Right, right. In other words, um, you're taking the idea, the idol uh, talk, of course, is, is, is inappropriate for anyone. And, uh, mm. and um, the praying and, with kavana is important, and, and it's more important than doing a mitzvah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That's what I'm saying. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Because... Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, Will, you were in the middle of saying something, and we cut you cut you, cut you off. Let me let me yeah, just mute I... everyone. Every so often, I have to <laughs> mute everyone. So uh, unmute yourself, Will. You okay. I was. Will, you got to unmute yourself. Oh. Oh. That's... Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, I could miss that. My son is a Balchuva. And uh, he brought this back from uh, yeshiva year, many years ago, like when he came home on the Pesach break, that they teach you to be humble. And so they're teaching you to be humble. Some of the students proposed, why don't we have a humble contest? See who's the winner of the humble contest. Uh-huh. <laughs> it may uh-huh. be a standard joke in yeshivas, I don't know. <laughs> well, th- there is a joke where uh, a bunch of students are, are all, uh, uh, you know, in the, in the study hall. And they're or in the synagogue, and they're saying, "I'm nothing. I'm nothing. I'm nothing." And uh, they're all saying, "I'm nothing." And then one newcomer come walks in, and he sits down, and he cont- and he starts also saying, "I'm nothing. I'm nothing." And all of the other students that have been there for years or months or years, they look back at this newcomer. They say, "Look who thinks he's nothing," <laughs> you know. <laughs> So that's uh, that's the uh, the official joke about the the nothing, but um, anyway, yeah, yeah, very nice. Thank you, uh, Will. Uh, uh, Miranda, yeah, uh, you're 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 muted. Okay, so what I was thinking is two things. One is that um, this man was looking for a shortcut to receive uh, a very um, great gift from um, Hashem. And that also divine inspiration is a gift, is a great gift. It's not, um, I guess it can be earned, but I guess also 
it's given after a, a certain a person has a certain depth of understanding as well versus taking a shortcut you know just doing 40 days of whatever you know right. kind of it, anyway right you're definitely right you want it to take a shortcut that's the that's the you know really uh um exactly what he was trying to do instead of refining himself and, and becoming holier he was looking for a shortcut so um we don't have that okay there, there is one more similar story where a, uh, a a very similar story where a, a person um uh had the same problem he 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 uh wanted to uh, get divine inspiration and uh he decided not to uh, he also found must have found the same book and he decided 40 days consecutive days and he'll be able to get divine inspiration and he lived in the time of Rabbi Yisrael, Yisrael Ruziner, and uh, uh, he went to Rabbi Yisrael Ruziner, and he, you know, and he, and he came to town because he ultimately wanted to ask him why didn't he merit to have the the uh, divine inspiration, and so he came to town, but he was a little shocked because he 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 he, he saw that this Rabbi Yisrael Ruziner was. Uh, uh, quite I, he conducted himself with with tremendous wealth and and um you know he, he, i mean it's such luxuries that he, that this uh this individual who was trying to uh uh you know get divine inspiration he was like turned off when he saw this rabbi with you know with 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 living a lifestyle that was not befitting of of, of you know of a rabbi he had to go, you know maybe uh like a golden cane, I don't know, or, you know, he had a golden watch and he had, uh, you know, all different types of, uh, uh, um, just the way, he, the, the way he lived was just not befitting. So he, he, he decided maybe he shouldn't ask this Rabbi Yisrael Ruziner his question because uh, this, this is not a real, this is not a real uh, uh, righteous uh, scholar. So, he, you know, so he stayed in Ruzhin for a little while and he was looking at, you know, he came and came in the morning, came in the afternoon, was checking things out, was looking at this Rabbi Shrel Ruziner. Anyway, finally, the day that he was supposed to leave, he saw, he came to, of course, to check out what's going on by the, by Rabbi Shrel Ruziner. And he sees that Rabbi Shrel Ruziner is preparing his carriage with the horses. Uh, they were uh, harnessed and the, the tzaddik is about to, Rabbi Shrel is about to, to, to leave. Uh, somewhere and uh, he approached the horses and he patted the horse on the <laughs> on its back three times. So this visitor who was just overly maybe angry or you know was was uh, um, um, you know maybe like uh, this whole few days that he was there he was just uh, shocked at the the way this Rabbi Shol Ruziner was was uh, was living his life. So he had the audacity and he said, uh, Rabbi Yisrael, what in the world have you just done? What is a tzaddik like you doing patting a horse? You know? And so the tzaddik answered him. This is a great line, he said. He said, listen, not a single word of idle talk has passed the mouth of this horse for 40 days. And they were consecutive. And so I patted him on the back. Now that is a that is a, a just a perfect Hasidic story, because it really says it all. Uh, it tells you how Rabbi Yisrael Ruziner knew exactly what's in the mind of this individual, and he he said exactly what was needed to be said. He he also hinted some you know hinted to him. That you know you're like a horse who fasted, you know, who 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 didn't speak idle talk for forty days, just like the horse didn't. You're basically the same thing. You're a horse who also who didn't speak, who didn't, you know, any speak any. I mean, he didn't say those words, but if you want to, you know, think a little deeper into it, uh, basically, you know, was was sharing with the person. And as Miranda said, he was, you know, he's looking for a shortcut, and he's really a horse looking for a shortcut. And you got to become a human. In order to get divine inspiration, you can't stay a horse. And uh, I guess that, that uh, you know, that really sums it up.
uh, our time is up, so I'm going to close the recording. If anyone wants to uh, 